Uh, this video is on um, uh, the topic of spectroscopy, the electronic structure of atoms, and uh, quantum mechanics. And the old books, it was chapter uh, six, now it's chapter eight in the, I think it's the <laughs> fifth edition of Tro. All right, so we'll go ahead with that. And we start by talking about a wave that is traveling through space. So this would be a traveling wave. And uh, it could be a light wave or a sound wave. <clears throat> we define the wavelength as the distance between the two maxima. And we can talk about the amplitude of the wave from this uh, zero point right there. <clears throat> Uh, some uh, useful equations and concepts regarding light. Uh, just mentioned that the wavelength is the distance between the, the two peaks. This symbol is the Greek letter, uh, Greek letter lambda <clears throat> for wavelength. And frequencies is nu. So it's a, um, it is, it kind of looks like a V except it's got a little hook in the back of it or, or heading, <laughs> heading backwards. And that's going to be the symbol for the frequency, Greek letter nu. All right, and then we have um, the speed of light. Uh, most of you know that from your physics classes. C is the symbol. And the speed of light, any um, wavelength, any frequency, any light wave that's moving travels at the speed 2.99 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And you can look at this equation down here, and this is the relationship between the speed of light C, the wavelength, and the frequency. So it's the product of the two, you'll see, will be equal to speed of light for every situation, for every light wave. And um, we can look at some numbers there in a sec. <clears throat> There's another um, symbol that we use. Uh, it's the same new here, except it's got a little squiggle on the top there, as you can see. And that's defined as 1 over the wavelength. I don't think I'm going to talk about it for this chapter, but it may have come up in the lab. I'm not sure about that. But spectroscopists use uh, wave number from time to time. All right, and then we have energy. And E will be the symbol for the light energy. Here's a, We started with uh, speed of light constant up here. And here's another constant down here, H. And it's called Planck's constant, 6.63, 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. So that leads us to our second equation here, that the energy of light is related to the frequency of light. And the relationship between those two is H, which is Planck's constant right here. So you can go back, you can calculate the energy if you know what the frequency is, as long as you know Planck's constant. Uh, you can take um, these two equations and um, let me write it out here. So from here, you can solve for nu, and that will be equal to C over lambda. And then you can plug that expression into this equation for nu. So you're going to get H. H here stays here. And then C over lambda, C over lambda is equal to nu. So you have uh, two forms of the energy equation here. Um, one is equal to H nu if you have the frequency, but if you happen to have the wavelength, you could use E equals H C over lambda. All right, these three equations are important. You should memorize those equations and uh, the constants that go with them, although the constants would be given to you. <clears throat> All right, here is a electromagnetic spectrum. Let's move it down a little bit. There is one mistake that's been corrected in your book, so this is an older version of it. And this is frequency with that symbol new. Wavelength is incorrect. So uh, this is kind of a complicated thing here. And um, Let's see, we've got frequency going from, and hertz is uh, defined, uh, remember frequency is defined as the number of peaks that pass a point per unit time. So you could say how many peaks pass in one second, or you could say use the word hertz instead of per second. So this would be 10 to the fourth peaks pass per second, or you could say 10 to the fourth hertz. So you can see the frequency increasing going in this direction, going from um, 
low energy radio waves all the way up to gamma wave rays. And then you can see the wavelength here is next, and um, that is going to be inversely proportional to the frequency because the product of those two is equal to C, speed of light. So if the frequency is increasing, then the wavelength is going to be decreasing, and you see that it gets very small um, for the different regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. In the middle, you have <clears throat> kind of a sketch of the energy. Radio waves, microwave waves are very low energy. X-rays and gamma rays are very high energy. So uh, you'll see here that the frequency increases going left to right, and the energy also increases going from left to right. And then wavelength is the opposite. And then it's just a little tiny part of the complete electromagnetic spectrum that's associated with visible light. And these numbers vary. Sometimes you see 350 is the cutoff for visible light. Sometimes you see 800 up here, but it doesn't really matter. All right, so um, let's see. In uh, the microwave region of the spectrum, so for example, if you take a cup of water and you put it in your microwave oven, you know, what is it that's happening when you irradiate water with microwave radiation? And... Uh, <clears throat> The answer is that um, the rotations in the water molecules get excited by the microwave energy. And so the molecules start rotating faster, and then in time, they'll dissipate that energy to heat, and then your uh, water will heat up in the cup. Uh, infrared light, on the other hand, if you excite molecules with infrared light, that's going to excite the vibrations in molecules. So you can have, um, let's say, you know, just a diatomic molecule like this. And, you know, in one instant, the molecule stretches to some maximum position. And then the next instant, it comes back. And so it's back and forth, back and forth, and that uh, sets up the vibration. And so if you radiate <clears throat> a vibrating molecule like this with uh, infrared radiation, it'll increase the frequency of the, of the vibration. Let's see what else. Uh, we have visible light and ultraviolet light. If you irradiate molecules with either of those, that has the effect of exciting the electrons in the molecules. They get up into these excited states, and then they may stay there for a very short period of time, and then they're going to give off light. They're going to emit light, and we're going to talk about that right at the end of this, um, this, slide, this slide show here. <clears throat> X-rays, obviously, are much higher energy. Uh, shoot you through your body <laughs> with a very short period of time and you can get an x-ray spectrum of your bones and so that means that the x-rays are going through the various tissues but not the bones so you get this contrast and you can uh, see your bones and then uh, gamma ray spectroscopy that is uh, with that you can um, <clears throat> irradiate uh, nuclei of atoms it's used in medicine, so it would be atoms and molecules in your body, for example. And then you have um, electrons that are uh, actually combining with positrons, and then they form ultraviolet light, and then you can image that. You could image different uh, organs in your body, for example. But anyway, it's very high energy, and they exist out in outer space as well. It's one of the high energy uh, particles. All right, so there's an introduction there to the electromagnetic spectrum. And I'm going to focus uh, in this uh, part one uh, section of the chapter slides on this topic, wave-particle duality. So it's an interesting idea and kind of a phil philosophical idea as well. And uh, the question is... Can uh, light behave like a particle? Can light behave like a wave? Can matter behave like a particle? And can matter behave like a wave? So we're going to step through a bunch of slides here to try and answer these questions. But first of all, just think of two billiard balls two at the pool hall or your pool table. Two billiard balls that collide, and when they do, you know, the faster moving one will transfer energy and momentum to the slower moving one, and then the slower moving one now has more energy and moves moves off 
conversation across the table. So the idea that things can collide and transfer energy and momentum, that's considered to be particle-like behavior. So we'll start there. All right, now we want to look at um, some wave-like behavior. And in particular, interference is relevant to electrons. So we're going to study that. And if you have two waves that have the exact same profile, so they have the same wavelength, right? They have the same frequency, the same number that pass a certain point per unit time. And the amplitudes are the same, everything. So if they happen to overlap in space, you're going to have constructive interference like this. So they're going to add together. So two waves become one. You have a doubling of the amplitude, but the wavelength and the frequency stay the same. Then you have the situation of destructive interference where two waves are completely out of sync. So they actually physically overlap, but they're, uh, the maximum on one corresponds to the minimum of the other, so they completely cancel out. So you're going to see waves that are constructively interfered and then other waves that are not, and we'll see that in the next slide. So in addition to that, uh, we can talk about what happens to a traveling wave. And this diagram might seem a little funny, but um, if you think of a wave like this, so you've got the maximum, minimum, maximum, 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 maximum like that. <clears throat> so the drawing is just showing you the peaks as it's moving, as it's traveling. And then uh, the next part of this is this, uh, you can take a piece of metal and poke a hole in it or a piece of wood, some material, poke a hole in it. And then the wave, when it comes through, looks very different. On the other side, you have this diffraction wave. And again, it's still the same. So you've got this at any point moving forward, but at the same time, it's spreading out. So that's referred to as the diffracted wave. <clears throat> All right, here's an example. It's a little complicated, but it's interesting too. So now you, it's called the double slit experiment. It's one that's pretty common in physics. So you have, um, you have traveling waves coming in to this, let's call it just a piece of metal. And the piece of metal has two holes in it. And now you're gonna have um, diffract, diffracted waves on the other side. So you're gonna have this one and then this one and this one all associated with that first source one. And then you have another set. They're all the same frequency and wavelength, right? And they kind of ripple out and then they're gonna overlap. So again, you're looking at the maxima, right? The, the, the lines indicate the maxima. So you've got uh, overlap of the maxima here and here, every, every red point here and every um, Every blue point as well. Uh, blue is the minimum, I guess. Yeah. So look, look at the focus on the red there. And so you have a wave front that's moving in this direction. And now focus on the red here. You've got these um, streams, if you want, of the maxima moving in this, moving all in one direction like that. Um, here is another depiction of it. This is very interesting. If you go online and look for this, uh, you, there's a video, and it shows that, um, in this case, it's water waves. They come through the little hole. And so the uh, circular waves are interfering, and you're getting these patterns where um, <clears throat> you have the maxima and the minima, maxima and minima moving as a front. And right here is a photographic plate, which um, is developing uh, certain spots or lines on it associated with the maxima um, there. So when you look at the photographic plate and you see light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, like that, that is evidence of interference. So it turns out that light waves can do it as well as water waves. You have the exact same behavior if you use light waves. You get 
uh, diffraction, and then interference of the circular waves, and you can detect it using a photographic plate. You can see absolute evidence for it. So it's proof that light can behave like a wave. Right? We know about the wavelength anyway, but uh, now we know for sure that it does. That's the proof right there, diffraction and interference. <clears throat> All right, so then um, we're, we're just interested in this, this idea here that light can behave like a particle in a wave, matter can behave like a particle in a wave, and so the next one we want to look at here is um, light behaving like a particle. Is that possible? So the next slide here shows you um, Einstein's experiment. This was around 1905. He won the Nobel Prize for this work in 1905, so the work was done a little bit earlier than that. But uh, it was a very novel idea. And you start out with a real simple picture on the left-hand side here. This is called the photoelectric effect. And um, you take a piece of metal and you polish it so it's very smooth and shiny. And then on an angle, you can shine light on it. Nowadays, you can do it with a laser, but back in the day, it was just light that comes in. And basically, you keep changing the frequency. Remember, frequency is proportional to energy. So you keep ramping up the frequency until all of a sudden you see this really remarkable result that electrons start popping off the surface of the metal. Okay, so this is, a, um, this could not really be interpreted in terms of light behaving like a wave, even though it shows you little waves right there. But instead, the idea is that light behaves like particles and these, you have a stream of particles that hit the surface, and then those particles collide, and when if they have enough energy, they'll knock out the electron particles, and that's what you see. So it's kind of like billiard balls where uh, the stream of light particles come in, and you get a stream of electron particles coming off. And that uh, was revolutionary, the idea that light behaves like a, a particle. It can collide and uh, exchange energy and momentum with other particles. So then um, this is useful in this six system on the right here. Let's see, pull it up a little bit so you can see it. So here is the uh, metal. Here is the light coming in and the electrons coming off. This is in a vacuum tube so that you don't get interference with the air and <clears throat> particles, other molecules. So electrons come uh, off the metal and are attracted to the positive terminal, this electrode, positive electrode here, which is connected to a battery. And the electrons are moving through, coming over to the um, meter here to register the electrical current associated with those light particles, and then back up. So this is a circuit. You can do all kinds of things with it. Uh, in general, it's used for um, photodiodes and photoresistors. So these are used for uh, light sensing applications. And germanium, for example, is a metalloid that um, by itself it's kind of behaving like a non-metal but when hit with light then all of a sudden it starts to behave like a metal where it can conduct, can, can conduct electricity so germanium is an example of a good photoelectron source and that would be referred to as the germanium photodiode so you can use that in the laboratory if you want to um, detect light of certain wavelengths and they're actually pretty low energy <clears throat> All right, so Einstein said that light behaves like a particle. It kind of works into that overall scheme. And uh, here is, is the equation for the photoelectric effect. And um, let's move that a little bit like that. And here you have the equation. So you have the light coming in, and it has a certain energy. Remember, energy is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency. And then you have the electrons, when they're ejected, they have a certain kinetic energy, which is 1 half mv squared. But there's actually this other term called W here, and it's referred to as the work function. That is not the same thing as W for the bomb calorimeter, same, same symbol, but it's different. 
And so every metal is different. It has to, you know, you have to irradiate it with light in order to see the effect, but the light has to have a certain energy. So you have to keep uh, ramping up the frequency or the energy until you see the effect. So how much energy is needed to actually remove the electron from the surface of the metal? That's gonna be W here. So first, the energy first coming in from the light is just uh, kind of being absorbed by the metal and you know, finally there's enough energy to start knocking the electrons out and then the electrons have kinetic energy. Now on a regular semester, um, I have a slide with a calculation. Maybe you wanna calculate the velocity with which the electrons are emitted given a certain frequency, but I'm gonna skip it for you guys since this is uh, a very unusual semester and we're kind of running out of time, but I wanted you to be able to see that anyway. Okay. So now we are at um, the photoelectric effect is proof that light behaves like a particle. We've got diffraction interference that light behaves like a wave. We know that in general that uh, any kind of particles can exchange energy and momentum, which is proof you know, that it behaves like a particle. So now we're down to the final question here. Can matter behave like a wave? And in particular, can an electron behave like a wave? So let's see if this is going to work, hopefully. Here is an example of a traveling wave which hits a barrier. So it could be a string that's tied down at one end, and then I'm holding it in the other end. So you kind of, I could shake my hand up and down and get the wave to start traveling. And once it starts to travel right here, then you can see down at the incident wave, then there's a reflected wave coming back. And those two waves interfere with each other. And all of a sudden you get a very different effect. What you're seeing right there is the standing wave. Here's the traveling wave. <clears throat> you get the standing wave because it's the wave is the string or whatever is bound on both ends and so it reflects back and forth and so that's an example of the standing wave and that's the kind of wave we're talking about when we say that uh, matter behaves like a wave the electron behaves like a wave <clears throat> okay wow that worked so um here's an example here's somebody's finger you pluck the string on a guitar for example and the string is going to uh, first, the, the wave will trap, once you let it go, the wave's going to travel back and forth or travel forward. And then when it goes back and forth, back and forth, uh, you get this standing wave. So in other words, if you strum the guitar and you look at it, you don't see the wave traveling back and forth. You see the standing wave. You see the string kind of moving back and forth. That's the example of the standing wave. All right, so I wanted to talk about the properties of the standing wave. And hang on. Let's see second. Okay, and so um, if you are strumming your guitar, then you have uh, the, you know, here's the guitar over here, something like that. And then you have the fretboard, which is a little bit long uh, here, with the strings attached, right? And so you can, you know, strum the guitar strings, and then you're going to see this kind of behavior here. So you've got um, in this figure, um, let me scrunch it down. So over here is the length of the guitar string. And then you have these patterns that uh, you see. So for the first one, we're going to call this, we're going to number it here. We're going to say n equals 1. That's going to be the situation where you just strum the string. And you can, when you look at it, you see this, you see this string going back and forth. You hear a certain note associated with it. A pure sound is associated with a standing wave. In uh, the next case, you put your you know, finger in the middle of the fretboard, right? And you strum it, and you're gonna see a standing wave here, and if you look up, you'll see the other half of the standing wave on the other side, 
and you're going to get a completely different um, uh, sound, right? It'll be an octave higher because the frequency is going to be higher for this. Then uh, you have the third, uh, second overtone, third harmonic, that's what it's called. Don't worry about that stuff. Let me number these first. Okay, and so for um, this third one, you could conceivably put your fingers equidistant on the line. So you got two fingers. You look again, you're going to see a standing wave, and there'll be parts of the wave in, uh, on s different sides of where your fingers are at. And you get that. You're going to hear a higher note again. It'll be a pure sound. These waves uh, have higher energy going in this direction because the frequency of the waves are higher. And then for the fourth um, harmonic or the third overtone, I mean, in theory, you could do this, right? You could put your fingers in three places equally separated, and then you're going to get a higher frequency um, standing wave pattern. <clears throat> All right, so what I wanted to show you here is that um, let's look at n equals two. You've got um, this distance here is equal to l, and remember the wavelength is associated the wave. Yeah, the wavelength or the entire wave is associated with starting in one point and ending up at the same point. So this here would be considered one complete wave. And so the wavelength would be equal to this. So in the case of n equals 2, you have that the wavelength is equal to L, the length of the string. In the third case, you can... Um, recognize that this is the wave, that's a complete wave, so this distance here would be the wavelength, and then how is that related to L? And you, you, you could stare at that a little bit and say, okay, that complete wave is two-thirds of L. And so you could write down here, wavelength is equal to two-thirds times L. In the case of the last one, the wavelength is going to be equal to one half of L. So lambda, whoops, is equal to one half L. And then you could go back up to the top and think about that a little bit. So in this case, the entire wave is two times L. All right, so then you can rewrite it again. And you can say the wavelength is 2 over 1, 2 over 1 times L, 2 over 2 times L, 2 over 3 times L, and 1 half would be 2 over 4 times L. So in general, you can say lambda, the wavelength, would be equal to 2 over n times l. So 2l over n. And what's n? n is 1, 2, 3, 4. So you'd want to write that. You want to say n is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4. And this can keep going. So this is an example of a quantized system, quantum, quantum mechanics. This is the topic here. Quanta means particles of or packages of energy. And there are quantum numbers associated with these standing waves. And this is an example, n equals one, two, three. Example of a quantized system which means that um, the wavelength for the standing wave can be either, well, okay, there's another way to talk about it. So if you have stairs, you know, you start out on this step, you can, you can climb to the second stair, to the third stair, and to the fourth stair, but there's no in-between. There's no half stair for you to step on. So it's kind of like that. There's just bundles or packages, or in this case, you got one times the height, two times the height, three times the height, like that. That's a quantized system. So there's nothing in between. All right, so then um, this guitar string is an example of a one-dimensional uh, standing wave. 
And the other thing you can talk about are the nodes. Let me put those in green. So for this wave, you have um, a node, one node. And when n equals 2, there's one node. This is the, the node is going to be um, the positions for zero amplitude motion. When n equals 3, there's going to be two nodes. When n equals 4, you don't count the ones on the ends, right? So when n equals 4, there's three nodes. So it's a one-dimensional wave. It has, uh, it's quantized, so it has quantum numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, 106, 107, 108, 109, 110, 111, 112, 113, 114, 115, 116, 117, 118, 119, 120, 121, 122, 123, 124, 125, 126, 127, 128, 129, 130, 140, 150, 160, 170, 180, 190, 191, 192, 193, 194, 195, 196, 197, 198, 199, 200, 201, 202, 203, 204, 205, 206, 207, 208, 209, 210, 211, 212, 213, 214, 215, 216, 217, 218, 219, 220, 221, 222, 223, 224, 225, 226, 227, 228, 229, 230, 230, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240, 240
one of the characteristics of quantum mechanics is that um, when, when they get excited, you know, they can have a certain energy. So this is like an energy diagram. So we talk about the ground state being the lowest energy, and then once it absorbs light, it might hop up to the next energy or the next energy like that. And by the way, um, back in the day, you've already studied this, the, um, the uh, Bohr picture of the atom was that, you know, the proton is in the middle, and then the electron goes around in an orbit around the nucleus, and then, you know, if it, ex if it absorbs light, you can think of it as being um, in an orbit that's further from the nucleus. And then you could have a third orbit as well. This is the Bohr model. And so the electron might be out here. And you can number them. One or the first orbit, the second, the third. So it could be through excitation that the electron is way out here in the third orbit. And so it gives up light. And it could go down to the second orbit or the first orbit like that. That is very similar to um, what I'm describing here. But the top one here, this Bohr model, that's a that is a um, classical model. And then uh, down here, I'm showing you that there are energy levels here of the orbitals. That's the quantum mechanical model. So in other words, you can excite an electron, maybe up to you know you number them one two n equals one, n equals two, three, four. This is a so it's the same ends. Right? But let's say you had an electron excited up here through collisions or something, and then it's going to come down maybe to the ground state and it'll give up energy in the form of fluorescence or phosphorescence. So maybe it got excited here and maybe it's going to come down to that level. It just depends. <clears throat> All right, so then molecules absorb light and become excited. Once excited, they can emit light as fluorescence or phosphorescence. Uh, fluorescence is very short-lived. That can be, it's excited for a nanosecond or a picosecond, and then it comes down and gives off light. Phosphorescence is much more long-lived. It could be a millisecond or a microsecond. <clears throat> All right, so then there are uh, two types of light emission. One is continuous, the other is line, and you can just think of all the, the um, light that comes from the sun, and you can use a prism to disperse it into all of its different wavelengths. And so you, you think of continuous spectrum, it means like all wavelengths of light. On the other hand, you have molecules and elements that uh, get excited and they give off very specific wavelengths, discrete wavelengths. And the cathode ray tube is used to show that. And uh, you can study the spectra and learn something about the identity of the emitting sub. What happened to my other slide there? Oh, I didn't see. So here's a real pretty picture that I uh, got from the internet. And you have these glass tubes called cathode ray tubes. We studied them in the beginning of the course. Uh, each one of these tubes, oops, each one of the tubes, these glass tubes, has a metal electrode in them. And they're connected to a voltage source like this. So you flip the switch on the voltage source and the electrons start to move through. Uh, each one of these tubes is filled with a different gas. The electrons start moving through. There's high energy collisions. Elect electrons start getting removed from the atoms or the elements. The elements are the compounds themselves, which causes high collisions. Other atoms get excited, and then they start to emit light. So it's a little bit complex there. But anyway, uh, the voltage is kind of the driver of this process. So you can see the labels here. You've got um, hydrogen, deuterium, nitrogen, oxygen, mercury, xenon, krypton, argon, neon, and helium. And you can see that they're all they all have different emission patterns, emission colors, um, and it all has to do with the um, different levels of energy. So the energy levels. You know, you're looking at emission of light from one level to another, but for each one of these uh, elements, like an, another one, these levels might be closer together like that, and so the energy difference gives off a different color of light. So, and we're going to study it in the next section, but um, the difference in energy here uh, is associated with a certain frequency and color.
All right, so light emission of excited elements and compounds in cathode ray tubes. This is uh, the electron giving off light. So here is an example of the hydrogen lamp, and um, oftentimes we do these experiments. I'm not quite sure what's going on this semester with the virtual labs, but anyway, you hook it up, and now you got hydrogen highly excited. It's giving off light, and you want to put it through a slit and so that you can direct a beam towards this prism. We don't use prisms nowadays, but this is uh, an easy way to think about it. So prisms um, disperse the light according to their wavelengths, and then uh, the wavelengths, when they're bent through that prism, travel different speeds and end up in different places. So you can see in this picture that hydrogen has these four beams. If you have one of those photographic plates, you can see that here's the red, there's the blue, and there's two more here, that's the lighter blue, and then that one, you hard to see, but that's the indigo. And then um, that would be the spectrum of hydrogen. If we put helium in there, you can see it's a different spectrum. Barium has a different spectrum. These are referred to as lines in the spectrum, as opposed to the white light, um, continuous emission spectrum. It's just all the wavelengths uh, together, nothing missing. All right, so we're interested in hydrogen here. There's something to say about um, the colors, but also the wavelengths of light associated with that. And Balmer was the one who um, first kind of discovered this relationship. And he didn't derive it, but instead he went into the laboratory, measured these wavelengths of light here, and um, uh, came up with this I guess you could call it a semi-empirical equation. So it's an equation that works. You don't necessarily know why. It's just in the lab. If you put in a number n here, you can actually calculate a wavelength, and the wavelength matches what you observe. So here you've got uh, different colors. The first one is red. The next one is blue. Well, I don't know. Um, I'm sorry, green. Going the wrong way. Green. Green is 486 nanometers. Uh, 432 would be blue. And then that last one that was hard to see, that's the indigo. Okay, so those are the colors associated with those wavelengths of light being emitted. All right, so we want to be able to uh, understand this Balmer equation, so I'm going to go through some examples with it. But what we find is that, um, you know, you basically you're plugging in quantum numbers here into this uh, expression that contains n, and you want to calculate uh, lambda. And then um, r is the constant right here. This is referred to as the Rydberg constant. It's a big number, 1.097, 10 to the 7, but the units are unusual. It's meters to the minus 1, so it's like those wave number. This is, a remember, 1 over lambda is the wave number, the, the new with the little squiggle over it. That's a wave number. Okay, so let me show you. So it's always going to be, for visible light, it's always going to be 1 over, where this n right here is 2, 1 over 2 squared minus 1 over 1 of these squared. And we'll get it in the next um, slide. So we, let's calculate the wavelength here given uh, n equals 3. So let's see if this is our equation. If we plug in n equals 3, what do we get? The answer is 656 nanometers. But I wanted to go through the math details here so that you are more comfortable with this uh, equation. OK, so we're going to use, go through the details here. So 1 over the wavelength is equal to r, which is 1.097, 10 to the 7 meters to the minus 1 times 1 over 2 squared minus 1 over 3 squared, 1 over lambda, 1.097, 10 to the 7 meters to the minus 1, 1 over 4 minus 1 over 9. 1 over lambda, 1.097, 10 to the 7 meters to the minus 1, 
uh, 0.25 minus 0.111111 1 over lambda 1.097 10 to the 7 meters to the minus 1 this difference is four sig figs here 0.1389 positive then uh, you multiply them together. One over the wavelength is equal to 1.5237 times 10 to the sixth meters to the minus one. Okay, the next step, what we wanna do is solve for the wavelength. So if this is true, then lambda is 1 over 1.5237 times 10 to the 6 meters to the minus 1. All right, if you're not comfortable with that, multiply both sides of this equation times lambda, and then divide both sides of this equation by 1.5 times 10 to the 6, and you'll end up with this. Okay, you can play around with that. Then uh, you keep going, plug that into your calculator, and you're going to get uh, lambda is 6.565 times 10 to the minus, oops, 10 to the minus 7 meters. We want it in nanometers usually, so there's 10 to the 9 nanometers in a meter. And wavelength then turns out to be 656.5 nanometers. And this is the exact match to the experiment. Lambda is 656 nanometers, and that is the red line. R red emission band or the red line, okay? So you can see the equation is very powerful. You can put in up here, if you put in N equals 4, you're going to get the green line. You can get the exact same wavelengths. If you put N equals 5 in here, You'll get the blue line. If you put n equals 6 in here, you get the indigo line. So you should practice that. And I think on the group activity, you have maybe the wavelength and you're solving for n. You're kind of working backwards. It's a good uh, math exercise. All right, now that's all fine. Those colors are in the visible region of the spectrum. And if it's the visible region of the spectrum, this is the equation that we had above that uh, this is two. This is called N final and this is called N initial. So you have N final equals two, one over two squared is one over four, which is 0.25, which you saw in the last example. So this, if you have N equals two here, then you can map up, map out all of the wavelengths for the visible spectrum. But it turns out that it's more general because there are other regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. If you put a one here instead, then and then the rule is that the that this one n i n initial has to be greater than n final. So if you have one here, you're going to have two, three, four, five, six like that. If you have n equals three here, then it's going to be four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on. And so this is the general expression now. And in terms of an energy level diagram, you can use the Bohr, the circles, or you can use the energy diagram like this, right? So if, you, if there's an emission, let's say this is one, two, three. It's going from two to one. This is your initial value of N, and this is your final value of N. So you would have two here and one there, and that would be an electro, uh, a, uh, ultraviolet band because n final is one. All right, and then go to infinity. Infinity is associated with uh, when it absorbs light that um, the electron absorbs so much energy that it's completely removed from the atom. So that's the ionization energy that be can be calculated from that. All right, so then here, um, this is more detail, and I'm going to write on this. So we have n equals 1 associated with uh, the final value, n final, and you're looking at the emission from 2 to 1, 3 to 1, 4 to 1, 5 to 1, 
And so this is the ultraviolet series. All can be generated, all the wavelengths can be generated from Rydberg equation. Then if you have n equals two, you can have three to two, four to two, five to two, and it doesn't show it's six to two for the indigo. Those are gonna be the visible, okay, right here. Then if n equals three, you can have four to three, five to three, six to three, seven to three. All of that light is infrared and it keeps going like that. So this is kind of the big picture here. There's the ionization energy where it goes all the way up to infinity, which means that it's enough energy to completely remove the electron from the atom. All right, and then the last slide here shows you that if n final is one, that's gonna be the ultraviolet series, n final is two, it'll be visible. There's three parts to the infrared spectrum. The one that is nearest to the visible has n equals three, then this is like the mid IR, and then the far IR is n final equals five. And um, this I want you to know, it's important to know that, the names of the people who discovered these um, emission spectra. So there's the Lyman series, the Bomber series, Passion, Bracket, and Fund. Uh, most people know, you know, the Bracket series has N final equal four, and then that corresponds to infrared emission, but I'm not gonna ask you for the name. Bomber is the one we've been talking about. That's how we started our discussion. Bomber was the one who first discovered this. In any event, just focus on this part right here. If I said to you near infrared, you know that that's going to be n final equals 3, and you can proceed from there. All right, that is the end of part 1.